So good afternoon or good morning or uh, to everybody. Good evening, maybe for some of you. Um, so uh, I will start this um, uh, second lecture today uh, by a very short recap of what we have seen yesterday. Um, so yesterday I started with a, a quite general overview of um, uh, RMT, I say random matrix theory and its application. So that was basically um, that was basically this first part there. And then I took some time to um, expose you to um, two different kinds of matrix ensembles where um, we uh, defined uh, two classes, one which are one one that includes the Wigner uh, matrices, which are matrices which you really define from the uh, matrix entries. And then I defined uh, the, 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 the so-called rotational invariant ensembles, which turned out to be extremely useful and also from the computational point of view. Um, and I discussed a particular instance of uh, matrix ensembles, which actually belong uh, to both of them, uh, which are the Gaussian orthogonal and Gaussian unitary ensembles. Uh, that we will again uh, encounter uh, today, of course. Uh, and then I discussed, I started to discuss the Coulomb gas approach. So I tried to show you, um, but that's merely where, where we stopped, um, where I tried to explain you um, how to interpret from the statistical physics point of view, the probability measure, uh, or say the the, the joint probability distribution of the eigenvalues of the random matrices, which is uh, written here. And I would remind you that this index beta actually uh, corresponds to different types of matrix ensembles. Beta equals one for the GOE, so real symmetric matrices, beta equals two for Gaussian unitary ensembles. So that means for complex emission. And following Dyson, uh, we rewrote this joint probability here uh, as a Boltzmann weight with beta, if you want, playing the role of a kind of fictitious temperature. And we arrived at this Dyson log gas in the sense that I can rewrite this P of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n uh, as exponential of minus beta times an energy functional of the lambda i's, which is written here and which then uh, sort of allows me uh, to interpret the uh, position, so, so the, sorry, the, the, the eigenvalues, lambda i's, as the, the positions of, 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 uh, of um, the gas of particles. And uh, the, essential, the essential ingredient, uh, physical ingredient uh, in, this, uh, in this energy functional is basically the balance or the competition, if you want, between the confining potential that really wants to attract all the, the eigenvalues or all the particles close to the center, while this repulsive uh, particle here uh, tends instead to uh, spread them out. And as a consequence, uh, we will see that the density of particles has a finite support, and that's what uh, we will study today. So that's really the, 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 the crucial thing to understand is that the interesting thing that we have here in this model is really the competition between the potential energy and the interaction energy. So let's try to estimate the typical scale of lambda i's. What I have in mind is trying to, to say, how, does it, how, how do they scale with n, okay? So to do that, um, to do that we will basically uh, estimate first uh, the um, potential energy so I call lambda typical, this typical scale, and I want to estimate first uh, the potential energy. So let's, let's do that. Oh, by the way, can you, list, can you hear me correctly? I mean, I'll, I, have, I have the mic actually that, you, that I used yesterday. No, no, it's okay. okay. It's okay. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's try the potential energy. Uh, and again, we wrote it this way, so that was just n. Okay. So if I want to estimate how it does scale with n, so I will say that all the lambda i's typically have the same scale, which is lambda typical. And 
how do I estimate uh, the scaling with that? So I first have n by two term here. Then each of these lambda i squared scales like lambda typical squared. And I have a sum here of n terms. So that's the scale that I get. So that's roughly of the order of n squared times lambda typical squared. Okay. So now let's try to estimate uh, the, uh, the interactions. Okay, so this one uh, is just, again, let's write it. So it's just half times the sum of from i different to j of log of lambda i minus lambda j. So the point here, and this is the main argument here to, 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 to understand, is that this term there, the log here, is just a number. I mean, in the sense that it doesn't scale with, with it is just, uh, it's just a number in the sense that uh, it's a number of order one. So each of these log here are numbers of order one. And how many terms do I have? Well, I have simply the number of couples i, j with i not equal to j, okay? So that means that this is just uh, of the order so this is typically of the order of n, n minus one by two. Which is at leading order, this is just of order n squared. Okay. So now, as I said, the main uh, the main point here in this model is that we, we have a balance between the potential energy and the interaction energy. So that means that uh, basically the, uh, these two terms should be of the same order, okay? So if I balance the two terms, Well, uh, what do I get? I get that uh, I have on, on the one side n squared times lambda typical squared, and this is roughly equal to lambda squared. They need to be of the same order. Otherwise, there is no competition and there is no uh, interesting physics there. And therefore, uh, this tells you that lambda typical is of order one. Okay? Order one means in this case, what I have in mind is that this is just of order n to the power zero, right? Okay. Yes, so, okay, I have this question about uh, the uh, order uh, of, the, of the log that I, uh, I used here. Let me just answer quickly. Um, so basically, um, in general, uh, for instance, uh, if I had, uh, let's just take another corner. Okay, so suppose that instead of of the log, uh, suppose that you would have the, the interaction energy that you would get in a true Coulomb gas in 1D. Then of course, in this case, uh, if I need to estimate the typical scale of that, then all, each of the terms would be of order lambda typical, Okay, so I need somehow what you would need to write is that lambda i, you can still write it as lambda typical times mu i's. And therefore, this sum in this case would be of the order of, oops, sorry, would be of the order of, so I have, as I'm saying that the difference is of order n. And how many terms do I have? Well, I have n and minus two, n and minus one over two terms. So that means n squared term, okay? And in general, you can adapt easily the argument uh, if you have any power here. Now, the situation is a bit different here because you have a log, okay? And this log basically tells you that this is of order one, okay? So that's, that's what I mean by that. 
Is it clear? So I guess in other words, whatever extra scaling you have in log, you can it becomes a sum and that you can absorb in the normal. Yeah, exactly in the in the in the exactly in the in the in the BN basically. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, very good. So that tells us that um, that suggests at least it's not a proof, but that suggests that typically um, the, 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 the eigenvalues are of order one. And in fact, uh, to be more precise uh, about that, uh, what uh, we can do is to uh, just compute the, uh, the density, the eigenvalue density, okay? So uh, that's really uh, what uh, will be so let's define what is called the empirical eigenvalue distribution. Okay, so I will just define this object as a counting function. So I will I will call it Rohn of lambda, and that's just the sum from i equal to one of delta lambda minus lambda i. And usually we had one over n in random matrix uh, models such that rho n of lambda is normalized to one, okay? Okay? So, you see, uh, this guy, this quantity here that I define uh, is, is itself, is a random variable. So it's a random function, if you want, okay? It's a random function because uh, for each realization of the lambda i, uh, this one will be uh, a, new, a new number, okay? So it will fluctuate from one realization to another. And uh, therefore, in principle, uh, what you would like to, to be interested in uh, is in the average uh, empirical eigenvalue distribution. Now, it turns out that uh, at least for essentially all the values of lambda, it turns out that in the limit of large n, this rho n of lambda, although being a random variable, actually it does not fluctuate essentially. So it means that in the large n limit, the distribution of this object is essentially a Dirac delta function. And it's called sometimes self-averaging, I mean, in the context of disordered system. So in other words, it means that in the limit of large n, uh, rho n of lambda converges to its average value. Okay, so now I need, I will use this notation uh, from the rest of, I mean, from now on, uh, this is an average uh, with respect to the distribution of the eigenvalues. Sorry. Okay. So that's quite, uh, so sorry, I should really say equal to. <laughs> Hi, Gregory, can I ask a question? Yes. Yes. Uh, like regarding how the introduction term scales, like uh, that you showed, what happens if like, like lambda i tends to lambda z? Well, this then is, is, this, is, this, this is a different story. And this has to do basically with the, with the, the, the gaps uh, between, between the eigenvalues. And I will come to that in a minute. Okay, okay. But here you see, uh, that's a good question, but uh, you see that here, uh, the sum here actually involved all the pairs ij, okay? So these matrix models actually are kind of mean field models. So they really involve all the pairs ij's. And that means that all, most of them actually are relatively far apart from each other. But you are right. I mean, there are, for some of them, uh, the difference might be small, but the-, the yeah, I was wondering like for large and maybe there will be some which will be like, uh, close to each other. I mean, yeah, yeah. definitely. I, I, I will come to that. I will come to that a bit later when I will really look at local statistics. 
Okay, okay, thank you. And I will discuss the gaps and the spacing if you want, yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that's one thing here uh, that, that says that uh, this, this measure here is self-averaging, okay, so. Uh, now I should add that this holds, uh, I just add it now, and I will come back uh, to this a bit later, but this holds in, not for all values of lambda, but this holds for lambda in the bulk, this self-averaging property. And I will come back. I will define what the bulk is uh, in a few minutes, but let's, let's just, 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 just to be correct. So more precisely, uh, if I look at the GOE or the GUE, uh, we can actually compute explicitly this, this density and this is given by what is called uh, the Wigner semicircle. Okay, so what is that? Well, it says indeed that in the limit when n goes to infinity, this rho n of lambda becomes a nice smooth function of lambda which I will call rho of SC for semicircle of lambda, which is simply given by this nice function. And of course, lambda, I mean, of course, it's not trivial a priori, but it turns out indeed that the density has a finite support. Okay, so if you just Okay, so it should be a semicircle. Okay, it's not really so nice uh, as I as nice as I as I, as I would like to. But um, anyway, it has a finite support, and so this is rho SC of lambda as a function of lambda. Okay, so that's again the result of this. Um, competition, if you want, or between the, 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 the confinement and the repulsion that creates this, this non-trivial density profile, which has a finite support. Now, uh, if you look at, uh, if you look at this, uh, at this um, uh, density here, so what I call the bulk, basically, I will come back to this in a minute, but uh, the bulk is essentially what happens when you are relatively far apart, far away from, 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 from the boundaries, okay? So that's what I would like to call the, the bulk, while the edge would be what happens close to uh, the border of this, of this interval, okay? So that's uh, the first rough definition of what the bulk is. Um, I will just denote it this way. So this is what I would like to denote as the bulk while there are some region there uh, which I would like to call so here would be the right edge and here would be the left edge so again what I was saying before is that if you take a value of lambda which is inside the bulb say here then indeed you will have this uh, self-averaging property that I was mentioning on the other hand, uh, if you get close to the to the edges, it turns out that the fluctuations actually are much uh, in more important, and as a consequence, you lose this this uh, this uh, self-averaging property. And uh, we will come back to these two distinct uh, regime here uh, more precisely uh, in a minute. Um, before uh, doing that, I just want to discuss briefly the universality and the generality of this result. Uh, about the Wigner semicircle, okay? Of course, this holds again uh, for the GOE and the GUE, okay? Uh, I should uh, maybe uh, say it again and write it explicitly uh, that this holds here for GOE 
NGUE. And a priori, it's not even completely trivial that both of them would yield to the same kind of density. But uh, it's interesting, I think, to, 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 to wonder how, uh, I mean, what about the universality of, of these results, okay? So this is a very hot topic actually in, in, in math. Um, there, are, there have been uh, huge progress during the last years uh, on, this, on, this, uh, on this question. Uh, I will not elaborate too much on that. But I will just uh, just give you uh, two main results. I mean, or at least just to set up a little bit the ideas. Um, we have clearly to distinguish between Wigner matrices and rotational invariant matrices. So indeed, uh, if you look at Wigner matrices, well, basically what happens uh, is that if you take independent entries, not necessarily not necessarily um, identical but just independent uh, with so first that the first moment say is zero okay so they are centered and if the second moment is is finite then uh, Rowan of lambda uh, will go to the Wigner semicircle. Okay. With possible uh, scale uh, transformation of lambda. That means that if you rescale your eigenvalue correctly, then you will get the semicircle. So it's quite robust for uh, Wigner semicircle so for, for, for Wigner matrices. In fact, uh, you can one can also sh add some correlations. So it, that means that if the correlations are not too strong between the lambda i's, there is between the, 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 the matrix entries, there, there are some rigorous results that also also prove uh, prove sorry the, the, the convergence towards the, the Wigner semicircle. So and I will not say much about that. Yeah, so the rotationally invariance is not required for the semicircle though, if I... Yeah, exactly. Ah, okay, it's just in for fact, any, yeah. Yeah, so for any Wigner matrices, uh, if you have this condition basically, right, um, then then you will get the, uh, well, then you will get the Wigner semicircle. Okay. Thank On the contrary, uh, so this is quite robust uh, in this, for, for these ensembles. The situation is, is rather different for uh, uh, for invariant ensembles. So again, in this case, uh, just to be to set up a little bit the uh, to recall at least the notation. So we had something like that. So let me just write it this way. And then in general, uh, what we have for invariant ensemble, you remember is this uh, sum of V of lambda I. Okay, because uh, this comes from the fact, I mean, what I was saying is that P of M, you remember, uh, I was just telling you yesterday that it has basically this, this shape here. Okay, I've included the M here, but uh, just for convenience. Now, in this case, uh, it turns out that if V of X, so v is, if V of lambda is sufficiently confining, then you will still have a finite support. And in fact, uh, what the truth, the correct statement is that if, sorry, if V of lambda increases basically faster than, than the log, so in other words, if V of lambda divided by log of lambda goes to oh, sorry, plus infinity when lambda goes to infinity. So if you have a potential which is more confining than 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 the log, then 
rho n of lambda uh, basically will converge to some limiting distribution. Let's call it rho star of lambda, uh, which will have a finite support. But in general, this will not be given by the Wigner semi circle. Except, of course, for the Gaussian ensembles. So typically, uh, it will have this shape. Might have something a bit random like that. Okay. Can be, it will be, it will typically have this shape here. So different from from the Wigner semicircle. And you will have an edge here. So I call it lambda e, lambda plus e, and another one which would be minus, sorry, uh, lambda e minus, because they are typically, they can be different. So they will be globally, if you want, different from uh, the Wigner semicircle. However, and that's quite intriguing, I mean, intriguing somehow and, and, and quite interesting too. Um, what happens here is that close to the edge, as the Wigner semicircle, they will always vanish as a square root, except if you tune your potential V of lambda in a very special way. But in general, at the edge, you will have a square root singularity as in the Wigner semicircle. Okay, you remember that. Okay, it's, it was not cl very clear on my, on my on my picture here, but there is indeed a, a, a square root singularity, right? Because because of this term. So if you look at what happens close to square root of two, this vanishes as a square root. And typically, uh, and if except if you fine tune your potential v of lambda in an extremely specific way. Um, uh, then, uh, then you might uh, you you will have a square root singularity here. Okay, I've seen the question. I will come to it. Measurement, but that typically will vanish as that. Okay, and the same on the left. And this actually means that if you really look at the edge properties locally. For instance, at the statistics of the largest eigenvalue, we will come to that in a minute, uh, they are instead universal. So globally, there is no universality, but if you really look at what happens locally uh, near the edges, then universality is restored. And I will, I will come back to that in a minute, okay? But the message is that for Wigner matrices, uh, you will get the, um, the, 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 the semicircle, Wigner semicircle under relatively reasonable assumptions, for invariant ensemble, the situation is pretty different, and it depends uh, pretty much on the potential V of lambda. Uh, what is the difference between Wigner matrix and rotationally invariant? I mean, I understand rotationally invariant, but Wigner matrices just have uh, non-zero, uh, non-infinite moments, right? First. Yes, that, that, yeah, that, that's the thing, yeah. But then rotationally invariant uh, ensembles also have that. They satisfy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so the main difference is that typically if you think of uh, a rotationally invariant ensemble, uh, if you want to have a matrix realization of it, then typically the 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 the, eigen, the, the entries will be correlated in some way, Except or it will have some structure. I see. Okay. Okay. I mean, only for Gaussian, it's uncorrelated. Otherwise, absolutely. Yeah. That's that's that that yeah that that was the 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 aim of the computation that I did yesterday is that from that point of view, the Gaussian ensemble is very peculiar. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's the main difference, is that gen generically for rotationally invariant ensemble, you have some strong correlations between the elements. Thanks. Okay, so there was this question uh, for Wigner matrices, what happens if indeed the, the second moment uh, is infinite? Well, uh, then in this case, uh, you, 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 you will typically have, uh, you may have various exotic behaviors depending on which moments is really diverging. 
um, and you be, you then go to the realm of what people sometimes called uh, Levy matrices. Um, that means uh, matrices for which the elements have uh, heavy tails. Uh, and um, the situation actually is relatively simple, but there are some nice new physics there. So you lose the Wigner semicircle. What happens typically is that in these cases, uh, if you look at, uh, it turns out that among all the elements, there is typically one guy who is dominating the rest of the, uh, of the population, I mean, of the matrix elements, because you have heavy tails. So there is one outlier. Uh, and uh, the physics, or say that the results are completely different. You can still do some computation. I will not touch too much on that. Um, but there was some nice paper by um, Bouchot, Ciseau, uh, Giulio Biroli also uh, have recently worked on this, on this, on this kind, on this kind of models. But that you really end up in something different from what uh, we are doing here, indeed. So that has strong uh, impact. Okay. So after having discussed this, um, this um, Coulomb gas and uh, try to show uh, what are the main features in terms of this of the global global fluctuations, namely this, uh, this this density, I would like now to to discuss local statistics. So by this, I have in mind that instead of having a global view of the of the spectrum, uh, I really want to look at what happens more locally. And uh, for instance, what can I say between an eigenvalue, which is uh, here and located there, for instance, or uh, on the other hand, uh, what can be said about two eigenvalues, the correlations between two eigenvalues that are close to each other. Um, so, and uh, trying to, to say something um, quite general about that. So, as I said, uh, as I try to illustrate it uh, on this on this uh, on this cartoon here, um, I have told you that there were basically two different regime scaling regime. It turns out one which is in the bulk and the other which is at the edge. So let's try to look first at uh, what happens uh, in the bulk and uh, what are the main observable that people have been studying. So that's the, the main thing that. So I will first discuss the bulk. It turns out that the fluctuations close to the center in the bulk or at the edge are pretty different. So again, um, the first observable that people had been interested in, and in particular in the context of nuclear physics, was the interparticle distance. So that means the distance typically between two consecutive eigenvalues. And that was, uh, in principle, that was quite interesting because um, we have seen that there is this uh, kind of uh, level repulsion between uh, two eigenvalues, so typically they don't want to be too close uh, from each other. And um, let's try to see and uh, understand what people uh, have come to in this in this topic. Okay, so typically I, I have in mind again the uh, uh, the, the Wigner semicircle. Okay, and we you remember that. Uh, So we have uh, a finite support, okay, which is of order one. And I have my eigenvalues or my particles, okay. I'm talking about either eigenvalues of particles, uh, eigenvalues from the one point of view of random matrices, particles from the point of view of the, of the log gas, Dyson's log gas, but I guess you, you, you got it. Okay, so you have your eigenvalues which are somewhere there. Of course, for finite n, uh, it, it is possible to have some eigenvalues which lie outside the Wigner semicircle. Okay, this is only in the large n limit that all the particles will be confined in, inside. Now you see, uh, I have n eigenvalues there. Okay, 
I have n eigenvalues. And they lie on a interval which is of order one. Okay, so that means that typically the the distance between two consecutive particles will be of order one over n. Okay, so if you are really in the bulk, if you really look, if you really sorry, if you really look at the typical distance between two particles, uh, then or two eigenvalues then there will be over the one over n. Now let's look, let's define the spacing, okay? So for that, uh, let me just order this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this random, this eigenvalues if you want. So let's assume that lambda one is less than lambda n. And let me call, say S, the spacing between two consecutive eigenvalues. Okay, so what I told you, and that's related somehow to one of the questions that was asked, indeed, uh, this guy can be very small and it, it will be typically over the one over n, okay? While, of course, if I take two eigenvalues randomly among this ensemble, so say one here and one there, then it's clear that they will be typically over the one, okay? So the question is, what is the distribution of this, of this S? Now, again, it turns out that if you don't go too close to the edges, that means that if you really stay inside the bulk, basically the distribution of this random variable will not depend too much on i, okay? So what happens is that, and the question that, uh, that we would like to know is, uh, what is the distribution, say, of, of s, okay? So if I just uh, denote by Pn of S, I just define it as the probability density function of the variable S. Now it turns out that in the large end limit, This actually takes a scaling form, uh, which I want to, uh, so it's uh, some function, P of beta, it depends on beta. So basically Sn is just the average value of S, okay? So this is a random variable. So I will just compute uh, the average of this guy. Now it turns out that if you normalize uh, this random variable, that means that if you just consider S divided by its mean, then it takes the scaling form, okay? I need to have this one over Sn here just by normalization, right? Because the integral over S of this guy is one, okay? So that's the scaling form that I have. And this distribution P beta, uh, actually can be computed explicitly. I mean, it, it, this is known under the name of the uh, meta Godin distribution. It's quite complicated one, but it turns out that um, its global shape uh, was already predicted by Wigner and it is well approximated by what is called under the name of the Wigner surmise. Okay, so P beta of X is very well approximated in practice by what we usually call now the Wigner surmise. I'm sure you have understood that. Uh, 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 you have already heard about it, sorry. Which is the result that you would get in fact for a, a two by two matrix. I mean, that's how Wigner uh, guessed it. Um, but it turns out that uh, the, this expression for P beta, so P beta of X is approximately uh, equal to Ws, Victor surmise, which depend on beta again, of x. And which is just quite simple. In fact, this is just a beta s to the power of beta. So I have a repulsion 
with index beta for two very close by um, eigenvalues, and then you have a Gaussian tail. Now again, this s to the beta, uh, the, the Gaussian tail is, okay, it's not so easy to guess, I, I suppose, I mean, except if you really do the computation for n, n equals two, but this one, uh, the, the, this, 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 this guy here was very actually is, is quite interesting because it really reflects the fact that the probability to have a gap of very small size, the probability for that event is very small. And that actually comes from the level rep repulsion. So again, this is not an exact formula. The exact formula is in terms of a Fredholm determinant or Penlevé functions. Um, but uh, it turns out that this is an ex typically a very good approximation. And in fact, um, it was uh, used, it has been used as a good indication that random matrices was uh, a good, uh, probably a good, uh, a good approximation, for instance, in nuclear physics, because for the following reason, uh, which is that uh, if you plot this P of beta, Okay, so let's, I just plot P, WS1, if you want, it's a function of X, then of course it will have typically this kind of shape, right? And the fact that it goes to zero uh, is, oops, sorry, yes, uh, this should be, excuse me, it should be an X. Okay, now it, it's important uh, because this level, this level repulsion, uh, in fact, uh, can be compared to the naive approximation, which would say that, okay, let's consider that the eigenvalues or the energy level of the nucleus, uh, let's suppose that they are just independent. Then if you just put random point on a line, and if you ask what's the probability distribution of having a gap of size X, then of course, this will be simply given by a Poissonian distribution. And the Poissonian distribution means an exponential decay. So that means that if you really, I mean, a sign, if you want, uh, if you want to really compare uh, with the Poissonian, it's quite simple because the prediction of the Poissonian distribution is simply that. And the fact that in many experiments, for instance, at the time of, of Wigner, uh, people were actually uh, observing uh, this kind of shape, uh, the black one instead of the Poissonian, uh, was a good indication that probably RMT was, 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 a, was a sort of nice, uh, I mean, a good model for that. So okay. Really, I have one question. So yeah. when you wrote down the uh, scaling relation formula, so in the n tends to infinity, average SN is zero. Isn't it? So you are essentially writing large and scaling dependence. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, what I'm saying indeed is that, so yeah, so this SN here, yeah, uh, SN indeed is going to, 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 to uh, so typically SN is, is, is of order one over N. Right, so what you are writing is a large and scaling function dependence. Yes, yeah, sure, so that means that, yeah, typically this will be a function of NS. I mean, that's what it says. Yes, okay. Yeah. You're right, this SN here will go to zero, absolutely. Okay, thanks. And you uh, really yeah, need, I, uh, yeah, normalization, otherwise you don't get, uh, I mean, a well-defined well -defined function, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, uh, can I have one quick question? Uh, so uh, is there any self-averaging property for this level uh, uh, spacing distribution? Uh, or uh, does it not have at all? Only if we do this average over the ensemble, only we get like some universal forms. I, I would say that this would not be self averaging indeed. I think that uh, the only properties that are uh, self averaging in general oh. in these models are really the, the global ones. Oh. Yeah, okay. uh, typically, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, like uh, when uh, we sort of compare uh, some level spacing of some quantum. Uh, 
uh, Hamiltonians, we sort yes. of don't do this averaging over like. No, no, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. So what they do, yes, you're right. Um, so that that's a good point. Um, in fact, what they do is that they do some averages over the 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 the, the successive uh, successive lambda i's. Yeah, yeah, local averaging sort yeah, of. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You really need to do that. So uh, that, uh, does that mean like if I just like generate like one uh, uh, big random matrix uh, 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 like sampling this uh, values from Gaussian? So if I simply diagonalize and compute uh, this distribution, I will not uh, uh, see this. Uh, yeah, that, that would be my guess. That would be my guess. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks. Is there a rule? Okay, there is a question there. Is there a rule to fix what fraction of support set constitute the bulk of spectrum? Okay, I'm just coming to that precisely. Okay, so I was talking. I was talking about about the bulk. Uh, now I want to 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 say I, I will I will come to 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 the to the to the to the edge in a minute, and precisely I will need to answer your question at that at that moment. Uh, before leaving the bulk, I just want to. So I I, I just discussed here the the. Um, uh, sorry, the spacing distribution, uh, which is clearly a very important observable. Uh, I want to discuss another one, uh, which is called the number variance, uh, because it also has attracted a lot of, of, of interest, and it's also easy to measure, uh, I mean, numerically, or say experimentally. So what is it? So the scope here is slightly different. It amounts to look at, so you look at the eigenvalues, which are, say, on the, well, somewhere there, on the line, on the real line, okay. And what you ask, so, okay, suppose that uh, you have the origin here, zero. Uh, what you ask is about, uh, the statistics of a given number of uh, eigenvalues, say, in a given interval, fixed fixed given interval. Okay, just to fix the idea, let's just define it as L by 2 minus L by 2. And the object of interest, which, has, which is basically counting statistics, if you want, uh, this is just the number... of eigenvalues uh, in this interval. Okay. So the, the mean number, of course, uh, the mean number of of, 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 um, of NL, I mean, okay, this is something that we have just computed, right? So it's it's easy to compute NL in the large end limit. Uh, this would just be the, the integral from minus L by two to L by two dx times the Wigner semicircle. Okay, so the mean number is already contained in what we have seen before. Now, what is usually interesting is precisely, and more interesting is what is called the number variance, which is basically the variance, sorry, the variance of this random number, the variance of NL. Okay, and that was, uh, so that that's, that's the, okay, so, what is, yeah, maybe uh, I, before giving you the, the result for, for the variance or what is known, uh, it's clear that uh, this quantity here, if you look at the, the typical number of, of, uh, of NL, if you look at, uh, it's, it's easy, I, I won't do the, the full analysis, but in the larger limit, uh, typically this guy will scale like L. Okay, so that means that this will be over the, over the L, okay. Now, what about the variance? Well, naively, if you had the Poisson process, uh, you, see, you know that in this case, the variance and the number of, of particles is just the same. So you would expect that the variance would be also linear. Now, it was shown by, uh, in fact, by Metad and Dyson uh, that this is actually quite different here. And in fact, it grows like the logarithm of, of L. There is a prefactor that I can give you, which is just two over beta pi square. So that means that this is much less than 
NL average. And so that means that the, the, that's a signature of the fact that so the variance of the fluctuations is much smaller than what you would get from a Poisson prone process. So that means that the spectrum of random matrices actually is quite rigid. There is some rigidity, it doesn't want to move so much. Okay. And of course, this has been, uh, this idea has been uh, made a bit more precise, but, but that's what really it means, right? So that's that rigidity of the spectrum. So it's more rigid, more rigid than than the Poisson process. And this rigidity, of course, is due to the correlations that you have between the eigenvalues, right? Because, so that's really due to this van der Mond term, this interaction term, right? Because again, if you look at what you have here, typically this kind of expression here. Uh, again, if you, if you didn't have this term, uh, then you would, that, that, that would mean that these eigenvalues here would be simply independent and you would expect to have some Poisson, uh, Poisson process in the limit of large n. But because of this van der Mond term, you have strong interactions between the eigenvalues and this, this is where the rigidity comes from. And Gregory? Yes. Yeah. So if I assume this approximate formula for this uh, gap statistics, right? It, can I get this uh, the other uh, form for the fluctuation of the number? Should I log uh, n n? No, no. Actually, they are they, they are not related. I mean, if, if I just start with this uh, uh, formula for the gap statistics, right? So you see the gap statistics basically is like the, pro I mean, they are not re exactly related because, um, yeah, that's a good question, maybe. Can you hear me? Because I'm, I'm, I cannot hear you very well, Sanjeev. So maybe to answer your question, I don't know if you can hear me, but the question is interesting, I think for everyone, uh, just a remark is what you can get is the probability that nl is equal to zero and that will be given by the Wigner surmise okay because oh you can can you hear me Sanjeev okay okay you're muted Sanjeev yeah sorry I, I didn't hear anything actually I was lost that's right yeah so what I'm saying is that the gap statistics is actually related to this quantity. Uh, uh, no, no. What I'm saying is that if I just assume the gap statistics, yeah, and uh, want to calculate basically how many points are there within a given uh, interval, and assume that these are independent, only uh, uh, I just assume that the, okay, the gaps are given by that formula. Do I get this one or I don't get? No, it? no, no. You, 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 you won't get it. Okay. You won't get it. You, you really so you need, need more. Down. You need more correlation than only you, the gap. You, you, need, you need really to take into account the correlations and really the, this rigidity that I am talking about. Given uh -huh. that uh, really all the eigenvalues are interacting. I mean, it's not only a short kind of uh, short. I mean, uh, next nearest neighbor interaction, if you want, in some sense. Okay. Yeah. But this one, uh, okay. Just to finish what I wanted to say is that p of n l equal to zero is just the gap statistics, basically, right? The gap probability, and so so that that's that is given by the Wigner surmise. This one, okay. But uh, okay. So now, what I want to discuss indeed is the edge. Uh, sorry, uh, like in the variance of NL. Yes. Uh, should not it go to zero if L is like? Pretty large, then all like eigenvalues will be inside the interval. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right? So, of course, this is okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. So, of course, thank you for the question. Uh, this uh, formula here, of course, is true as soon as 
L by two here doesn't or L by two is smaller than than the the the, the, the support of the, of of the, of the density. Okay. So in other words, uh, this is uh, you have to remember that uh, somewhere here. Uh, I would get, okay, let's take another color, whatever. This one, for instance. Yeah, somewhere here you will have plus square root of two. Somewhere there you might have minus square root of two. So I don't know, I could not recognize who asked the question, but uh, you see indeed that if you start to increase the size of your interval, at some point you will touch the edge and all the eigenvalues will be contained there. So that means that this result here holds uh, provided L by two is less than square root of two. Okay. Now what happens indeed, and that's that was actually studied by uh, myself and uh, Satya Majumda, Ricardo Marino and Paolo Vivo, uh, if you really plot this function, so that, that's sort of interesting. So let me plot the variance as a function of, say, log L, of or log of NL, if you want, log of L, log, log, log of L. Now, what happens is that, so there is uh, this value there, okay? So this is L equals to uh, square root of two, okay? So you will have this special value. We call it, uh, so that will be log of two square root of two. So what happens is that if you plot, so basically what this, this formula tells you is that in the log scale, this is sort of linear, okay? And indeed, uh, it does something like that. Okay, so it does something like this. It's almost linear. And then it, when it reaches this point here, uh, it does some strange oscillations and then, and then it becomes very small. And the regime that I'm describing for you now uh, is this regime there, okay. And when you reach the edge, of course, uh, you have a kind of dramatic effect. Um, uh, that uh, that is uh, in fact uh, um, described. I mean, you, if if you really want to say something about what happens there, you need really to to study the edge. Okay, so that was studied again by Marino, uh, Majumdar, uh, myself, and uh, Pierre Paolo Vivo um, in a PRL, and uh, we we did this nice this nice analysis. But what I was talking about here is really about this regime. So let's come now to the edge. Okay. And what is first indeed uh, the, the uh, essentially the uh, width? Sorry. Yeah, Gregory, before you proceed, can I ask one more question? Like, uh, yeah. what happens to the correlations of the gaps? Like, can, can anything be said about the correlations? The correlations of the gaps, okay. The gaps happens to be uh, weakly correlated. For instance, I mean, how, how, why, why should I say that? For instance, if you look at, I mean, people have studied the distribution of the largest gap. So you look, look at your gaps you, and you take the largest gap in the bulk. And this was done, for instance, by Bourgade and Benarus. If you look at the largest gap, uh, you, will, you will obtain that the, the, the largest gap is distributed according to a Gumbel distribution. So like the largest, eigen, the largest element of a collect among a collection of weakly correlated or uncorrelated random variables. So, but so you can compute this. Um, I will probably tell a bit more in one specific case. So generically, the, it's it's hard to come to, to make these computations. If you want to have access to correlations um, in a quite, I mean, uh, convenient way from an analytical point of view, it turns out that there is a special case, a special point. If you want beta equals two, which corresponds to the Gaussian unitary ensemble, uh, where you have what is called a determinantal structure. So you have a determinantal point process uh, where you have nice tools uh, to, uh, to make the computations that, that you have in mind. I will cover this probably, I mean, not exactly your question, but a related one uh, in the next lecture when I will discuss uh, the fermions 
because there uh, we also have a determinant of point process and and that's where uh, I mean that's the kind of things that we can do there. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so now let's move to, to the edge. So the first thing indeed uh, that we should wonder is precisely the question that is asked is what what's the what is the uh, the width the typical width of, of this of this edge region around around square root of two okay now uh, so that's that's what we want to the first question that we want to understand so one way to characterize this um, is to look at the fluctuations if you want of the largest eigenvalues okay so uh, to estimate this this width it turns out that uh, the, the correct way to proceed uh, is to define lambda max which is the largest eigenvalue And basically, uh, what I want to, to 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 so again, maybe I should redo this com this this guy. Uh, okay. So we have this big now. So let me again. Okay, and I have as we know, square root of two here and minus square root of two there. So the idea is the following uh, is, so I'm, what I'm trying to say is that one way to understand the width of the edge, which we call WN, um, I'm saying that the width of this edge, oops, sorry. Is to estimate the amplitude of the fluctuations of uh, so I will call it WN, which is the width. Okay. So to estimate it, uh, I want I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, I can equivalently uh, try to estimate the the amplitude of the fluctuations of lambda max. So what I'm saying, what I want to say is that when n goes to infinity, well, because I have a finite support, it's clear that the largest eigenvalue will be very close to the border here. Okay, so lambda max goes to square root of two with probability one, okay? So that means that if you really look at the distribution of lambda max from very far, uh, it will be a delta function at square root of two. Now, of course, uh, for finite but large n, lambda max might be slightly on the right or on the left of square root of two. Okay. So typically, uh, you, it may happen that in, for finite n, lambda max will be there. And I would like to estimate this, uh, I would like to estimate basically uh, this amplitude here, okay? So again, to estimate it, I will just make uh, uh, relatively, I mean, I will make the assumption basically that I will ignore the correlations if you want for a while between the lambda i's. And um, I will just say, okay, uh, to estimate this amplitude here, well, this is just, this lambda max is such that the typical number of eigenvalues in this interval between lambda max and square root of two is just given by one. And that's what, uh, that's how I will, I will estimate the width of WN, okay? So that's a standard, uh, the st a standard um, argument uh, from extreme value statistics which says that basically the number of eigenvalues in say in the interval
square root of 2 minus Wn, square root of 2 is typically of order 1. Okay, so that's the standard argument to estimate the typical scale of the fluctuations of the largest, the largest uh, eigenvalue. And uh, again, this simply says that there is no eigenvalue in this, in this regime, okay? Or well, typically one. So now I just need to, to count this, okay? So how do I count that? Well, this is just, uh, so what is this number? Uh, this number basically is just uh, n times the density which is just the Wigner semicircle in this case, I mean, in this approximation, integrated from square root of two minus Wn up to square root of two dx, and this should be of order one. Of order one means of order n to the power zero, okay? So it, it should, should be a number which does not scale with n. So now uh, you see, uh, you have to remember that this, and this is quite crucial, is that you have here, uh, we have seen, I told you, uh, that the Wigner semicircle actually has a square root singularity, okay? So this guy, because you are looking at what happens very close to square root of two, this quantity here, this rho of SC, okay? It actually is proportional to square root of square root of two minus X, okay? So now if you just perform this integral, okay? Uh, what, you, what, you, uh, what you will get, so because uh, you have this square root singularity here, if you just perform now the integral explicitly, uh, I won't put all the factors, but that means that N times, so this, is, this will be uh, proportional to WN uh, to the power of three by two, and this should be of order one, okay? And therefore that tells you that Wn is of the order n to the power, sorry, minus two third. Okay, so that's the typical scale of the, of the edge. So that's the width of the edge. Again, this is a scaling argument, but this turns out to give the correct, the correct, the correct prediction. Now, another uh, thing that I want to say is that I, I, I try to tell to tell you that the square root singularity at the edge was universal, so that means that this exponent is also quite universal here. Okay, so it's a non-trivial exponent, n to the power minus two third. And let's try to go beyond that. And uh, okay, uh, I've seen a couple of uh, one question. Uh, Ram Gopal, according to Dyson, classified Gaussian on, into three categories based on the orthogonal symplectic. Do do this symmetry transformation something to do with the rotational invariance of Gaussian ensembles? Are they same? Uh, yes. So uh, again. Um, uh, the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble is invariant under orthogonal transformation. So these are the standard rotation, rotation I mean, that, that, that we all know, but in n dimension. Uh, the Gaussian unitary ensemble is invariant under unitary transformations, which are in, implemented by unitary group. And the Gaussian symplectic ensemble is, impl is, is invariant under uh, symplectic uh, transformations, which are bit more complicated transformation, but again, uh, they are invariant under this group. Okay, so orthogonal, unitary, and symplectic uh, ensemble. So indeed, uh, uh, they, they, this, this, is, this is the idea. Now, okay, of course, uh, all these considerations came from uh, quantum mechanics and the invariance of your systems under these under this, uh, um, transformations, but this is yet another story. But, but, but to answer your question, I mean, the, the, these are the same, yeah, these are the same. So, so Jordi, sorry. So, as you said, these are the same, but uh, then in GUE, 
these are invariant under the unity transformation then the rotational invariance must not be satisfied so what we say the rotational invariant yeah, matrices okay. those are only goe yeah no what i'm yeah so that's what i wanted to say maybe in answering your question is that when i'm saying rotation i mean it's it's in a more general sense okay so it's invariant under unitary transformation or some kind of rotation right? okay, okay. generally when we say rotation it means those are uh, uh, symmetric under orthogonal transformation yeah exactly yeah 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 but again what i'm saying what i want to say is that what i'm talking about rotationally invariant transformers i mean i include also the the the, the gaussian unitary the gaussian okay. Invariant. okay okay exactly. thank you mm, thank you okay so now we are ready to to to, to be a bit more precise so we have now the scale of these uh, transform of, of the fluctuations of lambda max and now uh, we would like to uh, have more than that and say what, I mean, say something about the distribution of lambda max, okay? So that uh, leads us to the Tracy Wienham distribution. In fact, I should say Tracy Wienham distributions and uh, they were indeed uh, well discovered by Tracy and Widom in 94 and 96. 94 for the Gaussian unitary, 96 for the uh, orthogonal and symplectic ensembles. And this has to do with the following, okay? So it, it, it says that if you look at lambda max in the large n limit, so we have seen that the leading term is square root of two, okay? This is just the, the, the border of, of the support, the edge of the support. And then we have fluctuations, which turns out to be of the order n to the power of minus two third. Okay. Now this part is deterministic. Okay. But this part actually fluctuates. So that means that this part, which is of order n to the power of minus two third, in fact, has a, there is a random variable associated to these fluctuations. And the way it's usually defined is that we usually put a one over square root of two here. So this is a random variable. Okay. And this is a Tracy rhythm. So I will just call it TW if you don't mind. This is a TW random variable. And Tracy and rhythm, in fact, uh, were able to compute uh, the distribution of, uh, of a, uh, this random variable explicitly first as Fredholm determinant and then in, in terms of Penlevy function. And I just want to give you a bit, to be a little bit more precise here. So it turns out that for beta, equals one and two, which corresponds to GOE and GUE. And there is also beta equals four for GSE, um, for the symplectic ensemble. I will not comment too much on that. Uh, so let me define as F beta of X, which is the probability. So this is the cumulative distribution of this chi beta. Okay. Now it turns out that this distribution can be explicitly written in terms of uh, the solution of some Penleve equation. So let me just, I will not give a course on Penleve function. I, I would be, by the way, probably incapable of that, but um, there is a Penleve two equation is just this, the solution of this equation, which is a nonlinear second order Okay, so you have this equation like that. So it's a non-trivial equation, of course, because of this term. And by the way, if you didn't have this term, that would be just the area function, okay? So in fact, the full solution is specified by its asymptotic behavior for large S. So I am looking at a specific solution of this, of this, uh, equation which so area is, is just the, the standard area function which is by the way as i said solution of this equation okay so once you have this guy so this is called the uh, hastings macleod solution uh, but uh, once you have this this guy basically you can write f 
F1, F2, and F4, in fact, also in terms of Q. So for instance, let's let's just do beta equals two, for instance. So F2 of S uh, is just this exponential of minus integral from X to infinity dS of S minus X Q square of X, okay? So this is a quite uh, explicit expression. And in fact, uh, this at, at that time, I mean, it was quite, uh, remarkable that uh, this uh, distribution uh, can be expressed in terms of these uh, Pernlevé functions, which turns out to be also quite famous in the context of integrable systems. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, that, uh, that was one thing, but uh, uh, so one can say more about this function, for instance, uh, maybe it's useful uh, to, 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 to uh, just give uh, its asymptotic behavior just to realize that uh, it's really different from a Gaussian. Um, so I just compute the PDF, so it's F2 prime. And if you look at what happens on the left side, it has uh, this minus beta over 24 x to the cube. So it decreases very fast on the left side faster than a Gaussian. So it's pretty, pretty much asymmetric. And on the right hand side, you have this minus two beta over three times X, sorry, times X to the power three by two. Okay. So typically, I mean, this, uh, so you can plot this function. I mean, it has been tabulated. I mean, maybe I can just, uh, to finish, I can maybe just show. So this is typically, uh, so for, so this is for beta equals one, okay? Uh, so this is typically how it looks like in a log. Uh, so this is just a log here and linear there, okay? So it's clearly, I mean, it should be a parabola if I had, uh, if I had a, a, a Gaussian. Uh, you see it's very steep on the left and quite, uh, okay, slightly decays uh, more slowly. So, yeah, the nice thing is that maybe since I, I'm there, I mean, it turns out that this, uh, this uh, eigenvalue, um, sort of this uh, uh, tracy rhythm distribution actually has appeared in many models uh, in statistical physics, and in particular uh, in the KPZ uh, universality class, and um, also uh, in many other problems, which turns out to be related like um, combinatorics problem and so on and so forth. I just would like to be a little bit more precise concerning the KPZ equation, uh, since I will probably come back to that. Okay, so there is, uh, we, we, we have a review actually on, on that. Uh, I can, and we wrote a review with Satya Majumdar. Um, I can, uh, I will be able to, to give you some reference on that. Uh, I just would like to be maybe a little bit more precise on the um, cardar paris zang equation uh, because I will come back to that later. So what's the link between uh, this tracy rhythm distribution and KPZ? Okay, so for that, I need to, uh, a little bit, uh, yeah, 10 minutes, that should be fine. Uh, I need to, to show you how this tracy rhythm appear in the context of the cardar paris zang equation. So let's look at uh, uh, a one plus one dimensional problem. Yeah, okay, Trilip, sorry. Uh, yes, this actually, does, yeah, so that's the boundary condition. Uh, the question is, what's the, the condition on the Perle V? Uh, it turns out that this fully specified, uh, so if you, if you, if you specify the, the, the behavior at plus infinity, uh, that actually specifies the, the, full, the full function. It's a double derivative equation, right? So uh, you would need two boundary conditions. Yeah, yeah, but uh, okay, I mean, it's, uh, you can actually show that uh, the only specifying this, I mean, is enough in this case. 
I see, and you're on the uh, S is a real line, is it? So yeah, yeah also, also because you see, I mean, actually somehow you, you, you specify more than one point, right? You really specify, I mean, the value of S if you want, uh, it's not, it's, it's it, you really specify the full behavior of Q of S on several points if you want, right? It's really the uh -huh. full asymptotic behavior. Okay, and S is, the domain is real, is it? Yes, yes, it's on, it's on, yeah, it's, it's on the full real axis. Ah, okay. Yeah, this, this On the full real axis, not okay. Yes, yes. So basically, once you specify the value there, I mean, uh, it's all, it, it, it also specifies the value uh, at uh, s equals to minus infinity. Okay, and for beta equal one, there is a very similar expression. Is yes, it's a bit more complicated. Yes. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's uh, just. Uh, have a look at that. So it's a one plus one dimensional fluctuating interface. And so typically this is this is what you would have in mind. Okay, so I have, so this is the substrate as a function of X. And I suppose that I want to describe the interface between a stable and uh, a metastable phase. So for instance, you could have in mind an Ising model in, in the presence of uh, a magnetic field. And typically you would have something like that. Okay, so you would have a profile at a given time T. So that would be say, H of XT. And again, I have in mind that the, I have here a stable phase and here an unstable phase. Okay, so that means that uh, my interface really wants to proceed in that direction. Okay, so this, I mean, the dynamics of such of such of such model uh, actually uh, was pioneered uh, in the in the nineties by Kardar, Parisi, and Zhang, uh, which we usually call KPZ, and they try to, I mean, they propose an equation of motion for this for this for this DTH. Okay. So what, happened, what happens is basically that, um, so the KPZ equation uh, is the most natural kind of equation that it's a stochastic uh, equation, by the way. So it has just an interface, a surface tension term. So that would be the Laplacian if you want. And if I didn't have this asymmetry between the stable and the unstable phase, then the most natural equation to look at is the so-called Edwards Wilkinson equation, uh, where I would simply had uh, a Gaussian white noise here. Oh, can, can you just give me a, a minute actually? I mean, I, I'm sorry, I have, to I have to interrupt for a few minutes. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. So that, that's just a Gaussian white noise. So that's equ that, that equation uh, is, is quite simple to, to analyze because it's just linear. But to take into account this instability, uh, you have to break the symmetry between the stable and the unstable phase. And the most uh, natural way to do that uh, is to indeed uh, add such a term, which makes life quite complicated, uh, which is just a term which is grade H squared. And there is say a strength for this, for this asymmetry. And again, uh, this is because of the asymmetry between the two phases, okay? So that means that if locally you see that the gradient is important, then clearly, so in, in this kind of situation there, the gradient is high, and then your interface would like to basically uh, go forward in that direction. And of course, it's a nonlinear term, and it turns out that uh, it's a quite complicated one to treat analytically. Now, despite of this, uh, there has been quite spectacular uh, progress during the last uh, say 15, uh, 20 years. Yeah, 20 years now. Um, 
that actually um, showed uh, that. Um, so the main I will not I will not make the full story of KPZ, but um, initially people started to study a lot the exponents, the the critical exponents related to um, to um, to uh, this uh, uh, stochastic PDE. Uh, and people realized that there was also quite some universality regarding that. And then after this uh, huge uh, progress, the huge amount of progress, uh, people started to say, okay, it's nice, but then what happens uh, to the fluctuations of H of XT? So can one describe beyond uh, the exponents, uh, can one describe the full statistics of H of XT? So that means that, uh, so suppose that, uh, and then uh, let's look at the simple case. Uh, so let's start uh, at the, the, the case where you start with a flat initial condition. So basically, um, that means that H X zero is just equal to zero for all X on the full real line. And then you run, you run, you run this equation, okay? And in the large time limit, uh, what people have shown, and uh, I will probably not have time to show you that uh, in detail, but uh, it turns out that if you look at what happens at a given point X for large time, so you fix X and you look at what happens at the large time limit. Now for large time, uh, basically you can almost guess what is the leading term. Because of this term, which is positive, lambda is positive, uh, you see that there is a finite velocity on the right hand side. So the, the average value on the right of the right hand side is positive, and therefore there is a, a, a mean velocity that drives uh, your interface. And therefore, at leading term, h of x t is just proportional to t. So that's the leading term. There is some coefficient here, here c in this index f for flat. And then it was already known for quite some time, and many people actually had contributed to that, that there was a, a t to the one third uh, leading term, which was describing, which is describing really the fluctuations of, uh, of uh, the uh, interface. Now, uh, it turns out that the fluctuations of this guy up to a non-universal amplitude, which I will call the gamma, is given by the Tracy Williams distribution. Okay. Now it turns out that in this case, for the flat initial condition, this is precisely given by chi one. So that's the Tracy Williams distribution. Okay. So in principle, uh, you don't see any link, right, between random matrix theory and KPZ, but uh, there is one. Uh, it's it's not completely. For beta equals one, so for GUE. And this was done actually by uh, many many different people. Uh, in particular, Herbert Spohn has played a very important role. Uh, in this uh, in this in this story, uh, also mathematicians uh, have played a quite important role. Um, in the case of GOE, um, many physicists have uh, indeed contributed uh, contributed to that, and um, but also mathematicians, Kurt Johansen, for instance, um, Gino Bake. Uh, I, I will try to give you some. I mean, I will give you some references for that. Now. What is less clear is that it turns out indeed that the initial condition actually plays an important role. And that's somehow an indication uh, or consequence of the fact that we are really dealing, because of this term, I didn't comment too much on that, uh, but we are really dealing with a, a non-equilibrium uh, situation, uh, which is then quite sensitive to the, to the initial conditions. Now, if instead of flat initial condition, if you start, I mean, I will just end up with that maybe, uh, if you start with a curved initial condition, so 
So typically, uh, I don't know if you if you start with an initial profile, uh, which would be something like that, for instance, at t equals zero. Okay, so that would be h at x zero as a function of x here. Then you will have something similar to that. So you would get that in this case. Again, you will have a linear term. And then again, you will have an exponent one third. But now, uh, instead of chi one, you will get chi two. Okay? So this is the Tracy Williams distribution for beta equals two. And last but not least, This actually, uh, these predictions uh, were observed uh, in experiments uh, already quite some time back uh, by in the group of, uh, by Takeuchi and Sano. Maybe I can just, I'm sure many of you have shown this, uh, these curves actually became extremely popular. So they were able to, um, so this was, these were experiments uh, carried on liquid crystals, two dimensional liquid crystals. And they are able to, uh, they were able basically to uh, create two different types of phases. Uh, one which is stable, uh, which is the black one, and the, this one which is unstable. And they are able to uh, nucleate such, uh, so they prepared a system in the unstable uh, or metastable a region and they are able to nucleate uh, a region which is stable and then they see how it does progress. So this is supposed to mimic the uh, the uh, flat case and so you see I mean they were able to measure this profile which is quite close to the GOE prediction. On the other hand if they they, they were also able to nucleate this point like um, this point like region and then you indeed observe instead the GOE okay or at least Rather, rather closely. So this was a very nice, uh, very nice story, uh, and this has triggered a lot of, of works. In fact, uh, on uh, KPZ, I'm sure many of you have uh, 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 contributed. I mean, many of you that are who are here uh, have contributed to the subject. Um, but that was just to make uh, this is one connection, if you want, between random matrices and, in particular, the largest eigen the fluctuations of the largest eigenvalue. Uh, Tracidium distributions, in, in fact, and uh, many other problems of physics. Uh, okay, so we will uh, probably have, I mean, not probably, I mean, we will come back to that. Um, yes, so maybe, okay, I, I just had two questions related to KPZ, so maybe I can just answer them. Um, first question, Prashant, can you please explain what are stable and unstable? Yes, so for instance, I mean, uh, what I would have in mind uh, was a kind of Ising model in the presence of a magnetic field, for instance. Okay, so um, let me just do that. So let's look at uh, Ising model. In the presence of a magnetic field, okay? So if you look at Okay, if, if you just look at, say, the, the, the V of, uh, so this is a cartoon of V of C as a function. So this is the space of configuration, okay? And this is the V, uh, the associated V. So typically uh, you will have, if you add uh, a magnetic field, okay? Um, instead of having this uh, double, I mean, the, the, the typical phi four uh, or Mexican hat potential, then there will be, there, there will, they will be shifted, okay? So that means that typically you would have such kind of, oops, sorry. So you would have something like that, okay? So this is the minus one, and this is the plus one. And this is just one way to create. So this would be the stable phase. This would be the, the unstable phase. Okay, so what I'm saying is that if you put a, a, a positive magnetic field, all the spins would like to be up. So this one, I mean, would be favored compared to the down spins. And 
you can imagine that you sort of prepare your Ising model, say in 2D. So that was typically this setup that I have here. So this one would be the stable one. So that would be the plus one. And this one would be the minus one. So you can imagine that uh, you just prepare your whole system, say, in the unstable phase, which would be one ground state in the absence of a magnetic field. And then you switch on the magnetic field and you nucleate, for instance, a few lines on your Ising model, just a few lines, a few lines of plus spins. And what you will see is that your, uh, the, the interface uh, basically will move, okay, move up, and indeed will create this, uh, exactly this, uh, this is um, what, what, I, what I have in mind in this case. I hope it answers your question, Prashant. So next question, uh, Jean-Francois, for finite time, are there analytical results or approximations for H of XT solution of the KPZ equation to fix X? That's a very good question. Yes, indeed. Uh, this is more recent. Uh, and uh, we will, I will discuss this a little bit. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe tomorrow if I have time. Uh, indeed, uh, at least for the special case of a um, flat initial condition, uh, the curved initial condition and some others, uh, you can have an exact solution uh, at finite time. And I will come back to that because it turns out to be related to fermionic models that I will discuss tomorrow. So I hope I will come to that point. I'm sure I will go to that point. Thank you. Now, last question. For wedge initial condition, they're also empty. Yes, yeah, so actually wedge, wedge initial condition is actually the, the curve. I mean, this is because the, the full the full curve is 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 a, is a pretty complicated to do, um, so uh, what people, yeah, what I'm saying is that um, the curve the initial profile is a bit uh, is a bit complicated to do. So analytically, what you start with is with the wedge, and very I mean very rapidly say it evolves uh, towards this curve this kind of curved initial profile, and so this is the curve. So so the, the the, the wedge initial condition indeed corresponds to the uh, to GUE then. Uh, even with uh, just a singularity at one point. Yes, yes, exactly. So the singularity, in fact, I mean, it might it might look a little bit awkward, but uh, uh, so that's the way. I mean, uh, I mean, Spohn and others, Le Dussal, Sazamoto, I mean, uh, uh, have have uh, regularized it. Uh, I'm not sure this is the way that mathematicians uh, like too much, but. Uh, I think physicists can accommodate with that. And uh, that's the one which is quite convenient if you want to do the, the, the better and that's for instance, that, yeah, that's the yeah. one that they use, yeah. That's the first one which was solved by the way. Okay. okay. And just one more question. So the velocities for KPs is, is, are ill-defined, right? Uh, the coefficient term T? Is what, sorry, I didn't understand. So the velocity of the, for KPZ, it is ill-defined, right? If you start yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, so uh, what you need to do is to say this is, yeah, okay, so what Philippe is saying is that this coefficient here is, is ill-defined. I mean, in fact, the whole equation is ill-defined. <laughs> uh, and in fact, uh, it took uh, several years to Martin Heyer uh, to regularize it and even got the uh, even got the uh, Fields Medal for that. Um, there are different ways to regularize it. One way is actually to say, I mean, this somehow comes from the, the white noise, which has a delta correlation. So one way to regularize it is to introduce a, a correlation length in space of this delta. But strictly speaking, in the way that I'm defining it, uh, it's, it's indeed is, in, is infinite. Yeah? So you have to subtract some infinite way a little bit as people would do in quantum field theory. Uh, you need to, to renormalize it, yes. So the connection to RMT is only through the fluctuation part. Absolutely, yeah. So RMT doesn't say anything about this term. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, hi, Gregory. Uh, I had a question. Uh, this. Uh, uh, this connection to RMT, does it uh, uh, go further? Like, uh, for example, uh, have people computed, uh, you know, if you compute large deviations in KPZ problem, does yeah. it match to large uh, deviations for the RMT? Yeah, so uh, the, the, there are some similarities with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with RMT in the sense that uh, 
the global shape of the, the large deviations are the same, but uh, the, 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 the scaling, sorry, the, the rate functions are different. I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay. So we have been working quite a bit on that. Uh, I, I saw that Baruch Mirson, uh, he was here yesterday. Uh, I'm not sure he's still here today, but he has made great contribution to that subject. Um, okay. Other people have worked on that more recently, Le Dussal in the, in the student, Krajenberg. And our mathematicians actually are also taking it seriously. I don't know if Baruch is around. Yes, yes, I am around. Yeah, he is here. So he is the he is the, he is the specialist. He is the specialist of the large okay. deviation KPZ. I see. So there, okay. they are. So, so the answer is that there is there are some similarities, but uh, but they they, they 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 the 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 functions themselves are quite different. Uh, so the strict analogy is uh, something like height divided by time is probably yes. playing role like uh, role of the largest eigenvalue. Yeah, exactly. exactly and yes. And time is playing the role of uh, n, right? Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But I see. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. I see. Okay. So, but but there are there are properties of KPZ which 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 which, 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 which some some of some some calculation of KPZ may differ from some random matrix results, right? You know, you are saying yes. that if you calculate some large deviations, there is no. It's yeah, not yeah. exactly. Yeah. Strictly speaking, KPZ, I mean, the continuous time KPZ equation that I showed you, I mean, has some similarities that I indicated, but there are also some differences which include large deviations. Right, right, right. Okay. Now it turns out, so essentially, so it turns out that there are some other uh, models, discrete models uh, that people have solved, which are in the KPZ universality class, okay, which okay. are exactly okay. similar to, uh, to a random matrix model. For instance, Johansson, uh, has a very nice, uh, very nice uh, polymer model, which is exactly a model co that corresponds to the Laguerre Richard ensemble. Okay, okay, okay. And so there, the, even the large deviations are the, the same, of course, as the as the as the matrix models. But for the continuum KPZ, large deviations are different. I see, I see, I see. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah. There is also a third third order phase transition. For instance, it's because KPZ. I mean, tracy rhythm is there. But again, yeah, the 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 the. the the shape, the precise details are different. I see, I see. Okay, I guess uh, stop here today. I guess. Okay. Uh, I had one question, if, if I could. Uh, yes, you So for the bulk properties, when you look at this NL, the number fluctuations, so you showed result up to the second moment. Are the scalings for the higher cumulants or particularly the large deviations, all these things are known even for bulk properties or are they trivial? So the number of fluctuations that you looked yeah. in a small window, so you should result yeah. up to the second cumulant. Yeah, yeah. So indeed, yeah, in fact, okay, so what happens? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so from that point of view, the, the, the variance is certainly the most, I mean, so, sort of the, the, the most interesting. Uh, if you look at higher cumulants, if you look at higher cumulants, um, what happens, I mean, if I just look at uh, these kind of things, if you look at this kind of of of, um, of uh, interval, even if L is of microscopic size, say say of order one, what happens is that if you start to look at higher cumulants, the fluctuations really come from very small region around the uh, around the, the the borders, and they can be computed, in fact, from what we know, uh, basically from the sine kernel, and they can be computed uh, rather explicitly. So all the, I mean, but this, these are very recent results. In fact, I should say, I mean, this is something that we did very recently uh, in the context of fermions, um, but we were able to, I mean, at the, micro, at the microscopic level, that means if you really look at very, very small interval here, uh, this was known, uh, I mean, the cumulants are known, but what happens is that if you look, if you look at what happens on larger scale, uh, the cumulants doesn't scale with L, they are just constants. And so this log in uh, L dependence doesn't carry yeah, out the exactly. Cumulants? Yeah, precisely. It it holds only for the variance, but then all the cumulants are finite. Okay. Yeah. And this you could show from this fermion uh, mapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, yes. We 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 could show that from 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 the fermion problems. Yeah. Okay. 
And in fact, okay, I, I'm, 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 okay. And this has also been proved. I mean, uh, recently, this has, this has also been proved rigorously, in fact, by mathematicians. Uh, I, see, I see. Okay. And when you say fermion, is it like, is it, what, is it, you showed this mapping, but I didn't see where is the fermion in nature there. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, at the moment, there is no fermion, but tomorrow I will, I will, I will show you. Okay, okay, great. There, there is really a very precise mapping between the two. Okay, thank you. I hope it will uh, convince you. Okay, I guess. Uh... Uh, Gregory, I have a question. If, if I'm allowed, this is Baru. Yeah, yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, just a naive question. Uh, I never thought about it myself. So, uh, uh, so if we if we are talking about the the maximum uh, lambda max, so it is for typical uh, fluctuation. It behaves like square root of two, plus as you as you show the, the scaling like one over n to two thirds uh, times the the random quantity uh, of the Tracy Wiedem random quantity. Now, the question is, why is there no uh, systematic shift of the square root of two, uh, which would also scale as one over n to some power? Yeah, in principle, this would be possible, I agree. Um, but I don't know any... Yeah, uh, that's, uh, I don't know any model that does that. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's just hidden in a higher order, or, or, or it's just uh, uh, the average is exactly zero in some sense. No, no, no. no but average so is not zero, right? Yeah. No. Of chi beta there are zero. Actually, yeah, so there were corrections indeed, but there were, I mean, the one that I know, and at least for GUE, this is the case, uh, there are some deterministic, so to say, so to call corrections, but which comes with, with, a, with a higher power here. Okay, so the, so then the answer is that there is a shift. It is just a, 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 a subleaning. Yeah, exactly. Also, okay, average, of, average of the pseudom is non-zero, right? Uh, that's true. Yeah, the average yeah. is non-zero. So, so so it's that's there true. hidden there, right? You're right. Yes. Yeah. But it's still of, of 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 this power, right? I mean, it's still of this. I mean, I think Baku was was really uh, wondering whether you could have something with 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 a different power. Uh, which would be somewhere there, right? I mean, in, 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 in between. So. Well, sometimes, well, there are problems where this shift is like more important than, than fluctuations. And there are uh, other cases where it is less important and then you people usually don't talk about it. Okay. So yeah, in, in RMT, all, the, all, the, all the, the examples I know, either for lambda max or either there are some examples where people have computed it for lambda min, so the, the smallest. Uh, like, for instance, in the Wishart Lager like ensembles. Uh, and this is always the case that uh, there is cor the corrections uh, come, come to, a to a lowest order, actually. Higher order, sorry. High, higher order, yeah, I understand. Yeah, higher order, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I guess, uh, <laughs> yeah, so we'll uh, end here yeah. and, and we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Yes, sure. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay. See you all.